We'll continue in verse 14. Then Joseph, uh, then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us at all times and in all circumstances. Lord, that you are ever mindful of us, that you never forget us, that your steadfast love toward us is unfailing. And Lord, so far in Joseph's story, we've seen his humiliation. We've seen him brought low. We've seen him in the pit twice over. And yet, Lord, while Joseph has been waiting, you have been working. You have been teaching him. You've been preparing him and readying him to be the great leader that you called him to be. And so today, Lord, we pray that you would help us as we see Joseph's exaltation, as we see him raised up, that it would be a reminder to us who are waiting, uh, who are having to exercise patience, um, that Lord, you are, you are with us always, that you are working always, and that you've promised one day you will raise us up in glory with your son. There is a sense in which we've already been seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, and yet as we live in the already not yet We know that our experience uh, is not that yet in its fullness. And so, Lord, give us hope, give us patience, give us confidence, and help us remain faithful while we wait uh, for our soon coming exaltation. Lord, we pray that you would teach us this morning from your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Last time we left Joseph, he was waiting on God in the prison house, what he himself refers to as the pit. If you look at chapter 40, verse 15, it says maybe the word dungeon or something like that, but it's literally the pit, the same word that he used or that was used of the pit that his brothers threw him into. Joseph had spent much of his life waiting on God. He was 17 years old when he had his dreams of being exalted as a ruler in Genesis 37, verse 2. And his jealous brothers threw him in a pit to die because of his dreams. And yet, no, scratch that, instead we'll sell him off as a slave. So they sold him as a slave, and Joseph eventually came into Potiphar's house. He served in Potiphar's house faithfully. And Potiphar put all things under Joseph's charge until one day when Potiphar's wife made her forceful advances against Joseph. And when Joseph fled away from her presence, she made false accusations against him, which ultimately landed Joseph in the prison house. When we find him there, 11 years have gone by. So the story began when Joseph was 37. And last week, when we saw Joseph in the prison house, 11 years have elapsed. He would be forgotten by the cupbearer. We saw he interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker, and he told the cupbearer, whenever you're restored to your office, please remember me, please make mention of my name. And yet, he was forgotten. And so he had to wait another two years totaling 13 years before finally being summoned by Pharaoh in chapter 41, verse 1. And so it was at the age of 30 when Joseph was finally taken from the prison house and raised up to the right hand of Pharaoh. We said last time 
that waiting is writ large on the lives of God's greats. We saw it in the life of Abraham, for instance. We saw it in Jacob's life. We see it here again in the life of Joseph, that God's greats often have to wait on him. But while Joseph was waiting, God was working. The Lord was teaching Joseph important lessons and preparing Joseph to be a great leader. Joseph was learning to be compassionate and God-dependent and God-reflexed. You see, for Joseph, waiting was an essential part of God making him into the man he wanted him to be. And the same is true for us. Waiting to us sometimes seems only pointless and frustrating. But all of our delays, all of our setbacks, all of our frustrations come to us through the hands and from the hands of an all-wise, good, and loving Father. He doesn't waste any, anything that he sends our way. God is using our waiting for our good and for our growth and likeness to his son and ultimately for his own glory. You see, waiting is part of God's refining process for his people. In smelting and forging, something I know so much about, in smelting and forging, the cooling process is as important as the heating process. Metallurgists have discovered that changes occur in the metal itself during the cool down period. If the cool down is too fast, it can cause microscopic cracks in the metal that inevitably lead to fatigue and ultimately to disaster. So to ensure that the cooling process aids in strengthening, the metal is typically placed in a quenching bath. Then when the right temperature is reached, it's dropped into a constant temperature bath until it attains uniform temperature throughout. Next, it's allowed to cool slowly in the air until it reaches room temperature. And this waiting process is essential to ensure the structural strength of the sword to accomplish its end use. And so the analogy here is that we often go through cooling periods, through waiting periods. But what I want you to understand is that in those times, the great refiner uses that, uses that waiting, uses that cooling to build into our lives the qualities that will fit us for effectiveness and the ultimate end use that he has in mind for us. You see, waiting becomes an inescapable segment of the process. God is every bit as interested in the process he takes us through as the product he's forming us into, right? Hear that again. We often want to skip over the hard stuff. We often want to skip over the waiting. Patience isn't fun, right? That's why we drive like psychopaths in Houston. We don't like to wait. But God is every bit as interested in the process he takes us through as in the product he's forming us into. So Joseph has been waiting, but now his dreams are about to come true. Last time we saw Joseph in the prison house, chapter 40, and today we'll see Joseph raised up to the palace in chapter 41. The big idea of these two messages is that in due time, God exalts his servants. So last time the emphasis was on in due time, but today, this morning, the emphasis is on God exalts his servants. As I mentioned during announcements, if you grab one of the pastor's pal sheets this morning, you'll see that the outline from last week has already been filled in for you. Um, I got here a little late this morning because of what I already said. So if you're like, he's lying, my outline isn't filled in. I switched the outlines. So <laughs> if you got here early this morning for Sunday school, you might have got a pastor's pal that didn't have the answers filled out for you. But I promise they're out there um, updated. So last time we saw Joseph in the prison house, we saw Joseph remains in the pit, Joseph shows compassion, Joseph receives revelation, and Joseph is forgotten. And today we'll conclude with part two. 
The title for this morning is Dreams Come True. So let's turn again to Genesis 41 as we look at our first major point. So we see Joseph in the palace in chapter 41. Now this part of the story begins with Pharaoh's troubled dreams, which led him to seek out Joseph as an interpreter. So Joseph is waiting around. He's been waiting for two years and he's going to get a, a, a summons out of nowhere from Pharaoh that says, hurry, come quick, get ready. And he's rushed into Pharaoh's presence. So he's been waiting and waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden, now, now is the time. Now is the time when he's called. We see his summons in verses 1 through 14. So as we've already noted, these events took two full years. Uh, two full years have taken place before these events, between last week's events and this week's events. And there we saw Joseph interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker in the prison house. Now Pharaoh begins to have dreams. <coughs> and so let's quickly summarize these verses. In verses 1 through 4, in the first dream, Pharaoh, we're told, stands by the Nile as healthy cows are coming up out of the river where they like to stand almost submerged as refuge from the heat and flies. So there are cows that are coming up out of the river to, to, uh, for pasture in the reed grass. And then we're told that seven other gaunt cows came up and devoured them. And so Pharaoh, in his alarm, awoke. Verses 5 through 7, Pharaoh fell back asleep and he dreamed again. And this time he saw seven plump ears of grain, but they too were devoured by seven scorched ears of grain. In verse 8, Pharaoh was frightened by these morbid dreams, and he was utter, utterly perplexed as to their meaning. The dreams so stunned Pharaoh, we notice the narrator uses an astonished behold six times in verses 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7. If you look at it six times, it says, and behold, and behold, and behold. That's like a highlighter. That's an attention getter. And so <clears throat> this indicates something to us of the, the, um, the mood of Pharaoh's dream, right? This was not a relaxed laying in a hammock dream. This is an intense coming fast, frightening images, and the whole mood is creepy, right? There's something foreboding about this dream. So with a sense of, and then we're told that Pharaoh awoke. So with a sense of urgency, Pharaoh begins to seek out all the magicians and wise men in Egypt to interpret his dreams for him. But what's the problem? We're told that none were able, right? No one could make sense of Pharaoh's dreams for him. So in verses 9 through 13, all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembers, right? Oh, yeah, I knew there was something that I was supposed to remember. He had ignored Joseph's request in chapter 40, verse 14, where Joseph says, Hey, only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. Verse 23 says, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. But these events jog his memory. They prompt him to remember Joseph's request a full two years later. At last he remembers. And so, and of course, if we <coughs> read this story rightly, we've seen this over and over again in the book of Genesis, um, the masterful storytelling of Moses as God's quiet providence guides all the affairs of men. Every narrative, every story that happens in the book of Genesis, God's subtle hand of providence is at work. So it just so happened that the cupbearer remembered. Well, on the human level, yes, something caused his brain to trigger. And yet we know the real reason the cupbearer remembered Joseph is because the Lord remembered Joseph and showed him loving kindness. In God's providence, Pharaoh's search for an interpreter jogged the cupbearer's memory. So verses 14 and 15, upon learning about Joseph, Pharaoh sends for him promptly. 
Joseph is rushed into Pharaoh's presence after he's tidied himself up a bit. And Pharaoh requests, read, uh, commands. Pharaohs don't really make requests. But Pharaoh requests Joseph to interpret his dreams for him. And so dreams had landed Joseph in the pit in the first place with his brothers, but now dreams will secure Joseph's release. So Joseph has been summoned by Pharaoh. He has been called, if you like that term better. On the human level, Joseph had been called by a human king who was used to getting his way, right? Pharaoh barks orders and says, you do this, you do this, you do this. I need this guy, go get him. So on the human level, Joseph's been called by a human king who's used to getting his way in order to address an urgent need. But Joseph's calling was deeper than that. This was ultimately a divine summons for such a time as this. As we'll discuss more a bit later, Joseph had been raised up by God to the right hand of Pharaoh in order to preserve a remnant of Abraham's descendants from the famine that was coming upon the ancient world. See, it's ultimately not Pharaoh, but God who raised up Joseph. God has raised up, God has summoned Joseph for his good purposes, namely to preserve a remnant of Abraham's descendants. You see, this is always the pattern for God's people. When God calls his people into a saving relationship with himself, he calls us into his service, right? The New Testament uses the word call or calling in different ways. Sometimes it talks about the general call, which is the preaching of the gospel that goes out to all people. Anytime the gospel is proclaimed, that's the general call, and people might hear it and not respond to it. Then there's the effectual call by which the Holy Spirit of God causes a person to be born again. He causes the new birth such that they hear the outward call and they must necessarily respond to an inward call with repentance and faith. So that's one sense in which, or two senses, I guess, in which the New Testament talks about calling in relationship to the proclamation of the gospel. But also the New Testament talks about calling in the sense of vocation, and that's literally what the word vocation means, is calling. So I'm kind of just using synonyms here. But the, the New Testament talks about how we have been called in different ways, certainly called into fellowship with the triune God, but also called into his service, right? Called as ambassadors, called as bond servants, right? And so when God calls you into saving relationship with himself, he calls you into his service. Joseph had been called by God to be a great leader. But notice that God didn't just call Joseph into the palace, right? Like, oh yeah, I like that calling. I like that vocation. I'll sign up for the palace, right? God didn't just call Joseph into the palace. He also called him into the prison house. Joseph had already been walking in God's calling while he was in the pit, right? It's like, yeah, there's my calling there in the future. It's like, no, your calling is right here and right now. This is your calling now. Yes, that's your calling later, but this is your calling now. See, God has placed a calling upon your life, brother or sister, brother and sister. And we may be tempted to think of that primarily in terms of the future, we wonder what the next grandiose thing is that God has in store for us. Maybe he will call you to be a pastor. Maybe he'll call you to be a missionary. Maybe he'll call you to be a mother. Maybe he'll call you into public office or to be the head of some institution. Maybe. But what has he called you to right here and now, right? It's not wrong to be forward thinking Maybe God is preparing me and equipping me and calling me into this ministry and into this service in the days ahead. But what is he calling you to right here and now? You see, God has called us to be faithful, not just in the future, but in the present. 
God has called us to be faithful in the present, in the little things, in the mundane things. You might be wondering all the time what you're going to do when you grow up. And yet all the while you're living smack dab in the middle of the vocation that God has placed upon your life. Maybe this is the calling that he has for you. Maybe you're already there. You see, your calling isn't just then and there. It is here and now. So are you answering God's call upon your life here and now for this season in this place for this assignment? You see, whether you find yourself in the pit or in the palace, you must answer God's call today by faithfully serving right where he has planted you in this season of your life. He might have some other grandiose future calling for you, but don't miss the call of God upon your life right here and now where you are. So Joseph was summoned, and God has summoned us. He has called us to be faithful to him, whether we're in the pit or whether we're in the palace. We see next that <clears throat> Joseph magnifies God, and we see this in verses 15 through 32 with the whole exchange between Joseph and Pharaoh. You see, Joseph is living in a pagan land and serving a pagan king, and yet he uses his position and his influence in order to bring glory to God, right? Imagine that. While serving in Pharaoh's house and in Egypt, he is able to bring glory to God. We should note here the contrast between Pharaoh and Joseph, between Pharaoh's source of confidence and Joseph's source of confidence. You see, we see two very different kinds of boasting in this chapter, and in particular in these verses, when we contrast Pharaoh and Joseph. First, we see a worldly boast in Pharaoh, a worldly boast. So let's first consider Pharaoh's source of confidence. Pharaoh was incredibly powerful, right? Pharaohs, in fact, considered themselves to be divine. Supposedly, at least once upon a time, it is said that uh, one of the Pharaohs in history threatened his people if they weren't good and obedient that he would cause the sun not to rise. It's like, y'all better be good or the sun's not coming up tomorrow. Like, talk about a megalomaniac, right? The pharaohs thought that they were God, thought that they were divine. See, Pharaoh lived in the palace. He had prosperity. The land in which he lived was lush and fertile because of the Nile River. But as we'll see in a moment, the Lord is about to shake his confidence in all of these things. He is complacent. He is at ease in the palace. His life is easy. Life for him is easy at the top. And yet, God is going to shake all of that. He's going to shake him out of his complacency. We're told in verse 8, chapter 41, verse 8, that as a result of Pharaoh's dreams, his spirit is troubled, right? Everything is not well with his soul. So Pharaoh has this dream, and in his, in his dream, he's standing by the Nile. The Nile was the source of Egypt's fertility. So it's appropriate that this vision would take place there, right? Oh, the Nile, that's something comfortable and familiar, right? The Nile is the source of life. The Nile is the source of our abundance. The Nile is the source of our prosperity, right? And so normally the Nile would be a source of comfort and assurance and security. And yet God assaults Pharaoh with this terrifying dream that hits him right where he's at, right there on the banks of the Nile. The Nile was itself considered to be divine, but the Lord here will challenge that idea See, the Nile was no guarantee against famine. The Nile was subject to the sovereignty of God, just like everything else. 
and the Lord could cause it to dry up at the snap of his fingers, or he could cause it to turn to blood as he would do later in Israel's history, right? God is sovereign over the Nile. And so the Lord here exposes prosperity and affluence as a faulty foundation, right? The things that seem so sturdy and so secure in life can suddenly come crashing down, right? The Nile's abundance and fertility might not always come to your rescue. It will ultimately fail. And so Pharaoh's boast is in prosperity and affluence. And God says, nope, not there. The Lord also demonstrates the folly of putting your hope in kings. Because Pharaoh is powerless to stop the famine that's coming upon Egypt, right? This is a, a, an FYI, Pharaoh. Like, you can't stop these events from happening. They will happen. I'm just letting you know. You can adjust how you're going to respond to them, but they will happen. You can't will them away. So, Pharaoh puts confidence in his position, and he's used to getting his way, and yet kings are subject to the sovereignty of God. They are subject to the king of kings and the lord of lords. And so don't put your hope there. Don't put your hope in kings. Don't put your hope in presidents. Pharaoh also boasts in the wisdom of men. You see, whenever he encounters a problem, what does he do? He says, get the smart people, right? Get the intelligentsia. They'll have the answers. They'll know what to do. Get the magicians. Get the wise men. And yet they are powerless, right? They can do nothing. And so Pharaoh boasts in the wisdom of man, but God says, don't do that. Don't trust in human wisdom. Don't trust in human philosophy, human ideology. You see, this story teaches us that it is folly to make our boast in the things of the world. And so we've seen a foolish boast, but now we see, or a worldly boast, but now we see a godly boast. Let's now contrast Pharaoh's source of confidence with Joseph's source of confidence. You see, Joseph shifts the glory away from men and places it squarely where it belongs, right? All glory goes to God. Soli Deo Gloria. I'm sure if Joseph knew Latin, if it had been around in his day, he would have said, Soli Deo Gloria. All glory goes to God alone. You see, Pharaoh believes that Joseph <coughs> has some inherent wisdom and ability to interpret dreams. But instead of receiving praise to himself, you see, it's like, oh, I am very important. Yes, I see that all your magicians and your wise men couldn't interpret these things for you. It's a good thing you called me because I can do it because I'm so smart, right? I'm so gifted. I'm so talented. Now he says, look, I've hired the best guy. I've got all, money's no object, right? <laughs> I can hire anybody I want to. And I've hired you, Joseph, because I hear you're the best there is. But Joseph doesn't receive praise to himself. He shifts the praise away from himself and to God. Joseph uses this as an opportunity to glorify God. He contradicts the Pharaoh. He says, actually, Pharaoh, you're wrong. That's not how it works. I don't have this inherent ability. It is God to whom interpretations belong. Look at chapter 41, verse 16. Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. This is the same thing that he had told the cupbearer in the previous chapter. If you look at chapter 40, verse 8, he tells the cupbearer to tell him his dream. And then he says, Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. You see, that's part of Joseph being God reflex is he he always shifts praise away from himself and towards the Lord. Joseph correctly interprets Pharaoh's dreams 
as he recognizes that prosperity and affluence are no guarantee, right? In fact, he says that those things are guaranteed to fail. Pharaoh, you put your hope in the Nile, you put your hope in your crops, in your livestock, but those things will fail you, right? It's coming. Seven years of plenty, yes, but seven years of severe famine. Don't put your hope there. Those things will fail you. Also, the wisdom of men is finite and so often mistaken, right? <laughs> Interpretations belong to God. It's not in magicians. It's not in wise men. It's not interpreters. God is the one who knows all mysteries. God is omniscient. God is the one who is directing this show, right? God is the one who is ordering the events of human history. And so don't put your confidence in the wisdom of men. Rather, put your confidence in the Lord. So Joseph doesn't put his confidence in prosperity and affluence. He doesn't put it in the wisdom of men. And he doesn't put his hope in kings. Because he points out that God is sovereign, not Pharaoh or any other human ruler. The Lord has determined that there will be famine. And he will quickly bring it about. Look at uh, chapter 41, verse 25. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what he's about to do. All right. God is telling you what he's going to do. The sovereign God who does whatever he pleases, he tells you the way it's going to be. This is not a negotiation between rival gods. It's not Yahweh saying, look, I want to do this. And Pharaoh's like, well, that's actually not very convenient for me. Um, my schedule's kind of full. It's like, no, this is what's happening. Verse 32, now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. Everything out there is just free floating. All these men and people have free will and all these events are just happenstance and fate and chance. No, wrong. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God has determined what will happen. It's predestined. And here's the plan. Here's what God's going to do. He's sovereign. You're not. There's nothing you can do about it, Pharaoh. And so don't put your hope in the sovereignty and supposed authority of human kings because they ultimately are submitted to all thrones. All authorities are submitted under the authority of the sovereign God of the universe. As Walt, uh, Walter Brueggemann explains, the future in Egypt does not depend upon Pharaoh. He does not get to decide. In fact, Pharaoh is irrelevant and marginal to the future of the kingdom. Joseph has calmly announced to the Lord of Egypt that the future is out of his hands. In Genesis 41, it is clear that Pharaoh can cause no future, nor can he resist the future that God will bring. End quote. And so as we contrast Pharaoh and Joseph, we are instructed that we should not fix our hope on the things of this world, but on God. We must not place our hope in worldliness and materialism. And this is a good word for us um, as maybe just as Americans, period, as Westerners, as people who live in and around the woodlands and surrounding areas. This is the age of affluence, right? We are wealthy by the standards of history. We are wealthy even contemporarily speaking. As you consider people's levels of wealth across the world, we are wealthy, we are affluent. It is possible for a middle-class person today to live with greater ease and independence than Pharaoh did in Egypt. Your life is better than Pharaoh's was. You live more like a king than Pharaoh did. And as a result, it's possible because of our affluence that a, a man or woman never ever looks up to God for anything. Because they're like, I have everything I need. My life is insulated. My life is comfortable, right? That is the danger of the age of affluence. We are tempted to put our trust in worldliness and materialism, but friends, we know about rust, we know about thieves, we know about moths, 
And Jesus says, all those things can break down all your stuff. And so what should you do? You should lay up treasures in heaven, right? Because everything down here is going to the garbage bin, right? You can't keep any of it. And so instead, lay up treasures in heaven. So do not put your trust in worldliness or materialism. Do not put your trust in man-made philosophies or secular worldviews which forfeit the absolute truth that's grounded in the perfect character and omniscient mind of our great God, right? I am one of those weirdos who likes reading and studying philosophy, and yet it's so depressing, right? Philosophers were so arrogant and so foolish, right? And what is the, what is the kind of spirit of our age? It's like, well, who can know anything? Can't know anything for sure. You sure about that? Man-made philosophies and secular worldviews leave us with nothing but question marks. And yet we have the word of God. We have the truth. Capital T, not my truth, your truth, the truth, right? The truth, period. And so don't put your hope in man-made philosophies or secular worldviews. And third, don't put your hope in human authorities or institutions. As it has so often been said before, no matter who occupies the Oval Office, God is seated upon his throne, right? God is sovereign. That doesn't mean we shouldn't pray and hope that one candidate may win out over another or that we shouldn't be involved in that process, but we don't place our hope there, right? This is, we have no lasting city here, right? Our true citizenship is in heaven. And so we try to be good citizens of whatever country we find ourselves living in as the people of God. And yet we recognize that our true citizenship is in heaven. All kings and kingdoms will ultimately come crashing down, but it is Christ's kingdom that will endure forever. Therefore, we must put our hope in God, not these things, as Joseph did. See, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, right? Don't boast in these things, boast in God. Joseph was what we might call a big godder. Robert Dick Wilson was a professor of Hebrew at Princeton Theological Seminary, and one of his graduates was Donald Gray Barnhouse, a name that many of you probably know. Twelve years after graduation, Barnhouse went back to Princeton to preach in the chapel And at that time, his former professor, Dr. Wilson, sat in the front row to hear him. Dr. Barnhouse preached his heart out that day. And afterward, Professor Wilson came up, extended his hand to him, and said to Barnhouse, if you come back again, I will not come to hear you preach. Ooh, (laughs) that's not a good start. (laughs) Was it that bad? No, if you come back again, I will not come back to hear you preach. Why? Because I only come once. I am glad that you are a big godder. When my boys come back, I come to see if they are big godders or little godders, and then I know what their ministry will be. Barnhouse asked him to explain, and so Dr. Wilson said, well, some men have a a little god, and they're always in trouble with him. He can't do any miracles. He can't take care of inspiration and transmission of the scriptures. He doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little God. And so I call them little godders. Then there are those who have a great God. He speaks and it is done. He commands and it stands fast. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of those that fear him. You, Donald, have a great God and he will bless your ministry. And so don't be a little godder. Be a big godder, right? We can put our confidence in our sovereign God because he is big. He's worthy of our trust. May we magnify not lesser things, not the things of this world, but instead may we celebrate and magnify our great and huge and grandiose God making our soul boast in him. Moving on, we see, thirdly, that Joseph is exalted. We see this in verses 38 through 45 and 50 through 52. So Joseph says, 
It is not in me to interpret dreams. Interpretations belong to God. And so God enables Joseph to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And we're told that the two dreams have the same meaning in chapter 41, verse 25. The dream means that there will be seven years of abundance in Egypt, followed by seven years of severe famine. Verses 29 through 30 summarize this well for us. Seven years of abundance, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. So in light of these sure realities, we already saw it in verse 25 and verse 32, God's, uh, Pharaoh said, sorry, Joseph, Joseph said to Pharaoh, this is what God is about to do. This is what God is going to do. It's going to happen. So in light of the fact that it is going to happen, Joseph recommends Pharaoh to appoint an administrator who will be responsible for setting aside food reserves during the years of plenty in order to see them through the years of famine. So we see in verses 33 through 36, Joseph's recommendation. He says, now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. Joseph's plan finds favor in Pharaoh's eyes, we're told in the next verse, in verse 37. And so Pharaoh promotes Joseph to his right hand and puts him in charge of administration over Egypt's food stores. <laughs> what a difference a single day makes, right? Joseph has been waiting for days and days and months and months and years and years. And then yet, in an instant, his fortunes change, right? He's in the prison house that morning and in the palace that night. He goes from the pit to the peak, from the prison cell to Pharaoh's right hand in the course of a single day. See, Genesis chapters 40 and 41 have shown us that dreams come true. The dreams of the cupbearer and the baker came true and uh, we're told in 41 verse 13, as the cupbearer recounts, these are our dreams, this is Joseph's interpretation of them, and guess what? They happened, just like he said they would. The dreams of the cupbearer and the baker came true. Pharaoh's dreams will also some come, uh, soon come true. If you look at chapter 41 verses 53 through 54, it tells us, just as Joseph had said, these things came true. And so the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker came true. The dreams of Pharaoh will come true. And here, Joseph's dreams from chapter 37, dreams of him being exalted as a ruler at the right hand of the king are beginning to come true. Dreams come true. Now, of course, not all dreams come true. I couldn't help but thinking about like, you know, like Disney, like the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Not all dreams come true. I'm sure many of you have seen American Idol and Simon Cowell just utterly crush people's dreams. You're terrible. You don't know how to sing. Who told you to do this? <laughs> so not all dreams come true. But those that have been promised by God in his word always come true, right? If God says it will come true, then it will come true. See, that dreams come true means at least two important things. First, it means that God will always do what he says he will do, right? God gives these dreams. He gives these predictions, these prophecies. And guess what? They're fulfilled every time, 100% of the time. God does what he says he will do. The Lord is able to do anything he wants to, and he cannot lie, and he will not lie. 
So we can trust God totally because he has always shown himself to be faithful time and time again. He's shown us his has said his steadfast love, his covenant faithfulness. Men may fail us, men may be unfaithful, but God keeps his word, right? And so that dreams come true means God will always do what he says he will do. But secondly, it means that God has prepared a glorious future for his people, right? One of the things that God has said he will do, because everything he says he will do, he will do. One of the things he says he will do is prepare a glorious future for his people with him, right? So that dreams will come true means there is a glorious future awaiting the people of God. See, we have the assurance that in due time, God will exalt his servants, And we see that truth played out here in the exaltation of Joseph. So let's look at Joseph's exaltation together. We see this um, like beginning in verse 38 and running down through verse 45. Pharaoh sets Joseph in charge over all the land of Egypt, we're told in verse 41. He is Pharaoh's right-hand man. He is, we're told, second in command, if you look at verse 40. And with this position of authority, all the people are obligated to do homage to Joseph, verse 40 tells us. Do homage, that translation, is nearest the Hebrew, which is literally kiss, to kiss. This agrees well with the metaphor either of an homage kiss, which was a common enthronement custom, or of kissing the dust, prostrating oneself, which corresponds to an Egyptian idiom. And so it's, do homage is literally kiss, to kiss him. So all people are commanded to do homage to Joseph with his new position. And similarly, we're told that all people are commanded to bow the knee before him, verse 43. So there's kind of this uh, procession, this uh, lifting up publicly of Joseph. And as he goes along in the second chariot, uh, everyone who he's approaching are told, bow the knee, bow the knee, bow the knee before him. Joseph is also given new apparel corresponding to his new position. We're told that Pharaoh gave Joseph his signet ring, right, which symbolizes his authority. The signet ring is that with which Pharaoh makes decrees, right? Pharaoh says, this is my will, and he seals it with his signet ring. He takes it off his hand, and he gives it to Joseph. He says, I'm giving that authority to you, right? Here's my signet ring. We're told that he clothed him in fine linen, and gave him a gold necklace. So you see all this in verse 42. Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen, and he put the gold necklace around his neck, the gold necklace being a symbol of uh, the pharaohs in Egypt, right? It's kind of like, you know, the, the emblem of the United States, right, that you might see on a lectern where the president of the United States is speaking. Right, it's the symbol of power and authority in Egypt. And Joseph rode in the second chariot. What's interesting is that each of Joseph's previous misfortunes involved him being stripped, being stripped of his clothes. His brothers took away his fancy coat. Potiphar's wife grabbed his outer garment as he fled from her presence. And so he's stripped and thrown into a pit twice and yet here he's clothed and raised up to the palace here his restoration began with the transformation of his clothing see when joseph was in the prison house he asked the cupbearer not to forget him and to show him loving kindness has said but the cupbearer forgot about joseph anyway but what we noted last time and again this time, is that the Lord never forgot about Joseph. He was with Joseph every step of the way. 
in Jacob's house, in the pit, in Potiphar's house, in the prison house, and now in Pharaoh's house. God is always with Joseph. And the Lord's loving kindness toward Joseph was unfailing, unchanging. And now he showers Joseph with his loving kindness by lifting up his head and exalting him to the palace. And so we see that God always exalts his servants in due time. In his humiliation and subsequent exaltation, Joseph lays down for us a pattern in at least a couple of ways. He lays down a type of Christ for us and many, if not most, interpreters from various different theological backgrounds um, are able to agree that Joseph is a type of Christ in many ways. So Joseph lays down a pattern in at least a couple of ways. One, as a type of Christ, and two, I would say, as a paradigm of the experience of every believer, that we go from humiliation to exaltation, that as New Testament believers, we have to carry our cross and die daily, and yet ultimately we will wear our crown as we reign with Christ. Sidney Gradena says that the primary typological theme of this story that points forward to Jesus is that of exaltation. So the primary typological connection we should see in this narrative is this exaltation theme. And so let's consider the ways in which Jesus was like Joseph and yet greater than Joseph. See, though Jesus shared eternal glory with the Father and the Spirit, he voluntarily humbled himself. He condescended, taking on human flesh and taking the form of a bond servant. He stooped low, right? He came low. He came near to us. He was born in a manger. He lived as the carpenter's son. One of his most well-known titles is the suffering servant, as he lived a life filled with sufferings that culminated in his sufferings on the cross. See, it was there at the cross that Jesus endured the ultimate humiliation by dying a criminal's death and becoming sin for us. As we saw, the fates of the cupbearer and the chief baker were told that the chief baker was hanged upon a tree. I think Jorge's translation had it impaled. He was impaled. Jesus died this kind of criminal's death as he was hanged upon a tree, becoming sin for us, bearing the wrath of God, which we so richly deserved. And Jesus descended to Sheol, the place of the righteous dead. Jesus predicts his own coming death and burial when he says that just as Joseph was three days in the heart, in the belly of the fish, in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days in the heart of the earth. Jesus descended to the pit for his people. But on the third day, the Father, we're told, raised him up again and glorified his servant, Jesus. Jesus is given all authority in heaven and on earth, as we so often hear in the Great Commission. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus, Philippians 2 says, was given the name above every name. Jesus was exalted to the right hand of the king, and we're told that one day every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess him, right? On earth, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, all people will bow the knee one day before King Jesus. Bow the knee, make way for him. See, Jesus' exaltation is pictured in Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm. And there, kings and nations are commanded to do homage to the Son. If you read Psalm 2, very clearly the Son is the Messiah. God, Yahweh says, he has installed his Christ, his Messiah, on Mount Zion. And so the kings and nations are instructed in Psalm 2, verse 12, to do homage to the Son. The word is nashak, literally kiss. And it is the same word 
that's used in Genesis 41:40 with reference to Joseph. Kiss Joseph. Do homage to Joseph. That is a pattern, that is a type, which is fulfilled more ultimately as all the nations are commanded to come and bow down before King Jesus and do homage to him, to rightly recognize that he has the name above every name. You see, Jesus is clothed in a glorified body and he has given a kingdom that will know no end. The trajectory of Joseph's life was from the pit to the palace. The trajectory of Jesus' life was from the pit to the palace. And the trajectory of our lives is similarly from the pit to the palace. We were born sinners and sufferers, but Jesus came to rescue us from the pit of hell and to raise us up to heavenly places with him. And one day our sufferings will come to an end and we will reign with him on a renewed earth. Just as Jesus was glorified, we're promised that so too we will be glorified with him. When Jesus appears, all of our dreams as God's people will come true. Dreams that are in accordance with the will of King Jesus See, when Jesus appears, he will make all things new. He will make us forget our afflictions. Coming back to Joseph's story in verses 50 through 52, following Joseph's exaltation, we're told in verses 50 through 52 that two sons were born to him. His first son, Manasseh, means he who causes to forget. And the birth of that little boy helped Joseph to forget the appalling hardship of his initial 13 years in Egypt, right? You have these repeated themes through these two chapters, and one of them is that of forgetting and remembrance. And we have the assurance and the comfort that the Lord will not forget his people. He will remember his people. But though the Lord doesn't forget us, he causes us to forget Namely, he causes us to forget our years of affliction. When Christ appears, the book of Revelation tells us the former things will pass away. Revelation 21 verse 4. There will be no more death. There will be no more tears. Jesus will cause all the sad things to come untrue to lift a line from Tolkien. You see, our momentary light affliction will be nothing in comparison with the glory that is to be revealed to us, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Everything you're going through now may be terrible. It may be the worst. You may be suffering. You may be drowning. And yet 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says that when the glory which has been prepared for us as the people of God is revealed, we will forget all of that. That will be of no account. That will be about as important as what you ate for breakfast this morning. Whenever you stand before King Jesus and see him face to face and see the glory that God has prepared for you from eternity past, you will absolutely forget your afflictions as you are enraptured in the presence of our triune God and King Jesus. Joseph's second son was called Ephraim, which means fruitfulness. See, Joseph had gone through periods of famine, and yet now he experiences fullness. See, the Lord, just as he did for Joseph, he will give us beauty for ashes. He will restore the years that have been eaten by the locust. He will replace famine with fullness. He will give us fruitfulness. And so in light of Joseph's exaltation, and in light of Christ's exaltation, and in light of our promised exaltation, we must take heart, friends, because in due time, God always exalts his servants. We come now quickly to our last point, and here we see that Joseph provides deliverance. See, God raised up Joseph and used him as a blessing to the world. 
just as the Lord predicted through Pharaoh's dreams, there were seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. And when the famine was on, people came from all over that part of the ancient world in order to get grain from Egypt. All the nations were drawn to Joseph as the source of the bread of life to sustain them through the famine. And when you put it that way, I think the typology here isn't hard to see. In verse 49, we're told that Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the seashore. That sounds like a familiar phrase. We've heard that before, like the stars in the sky and like the sand of the seashore. This phrase invokes the language of the Abrahamic covenant where Abraham was told that his seed would be more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And so you hear that language and you begin thinking, oh, Abraham, the seed of Abraham. See, it was through Abraham's seed that all the earth would be blessed, Genesis 12, verse 3. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 are a great summary of the Abrahamic covenant. And we have this whole land, seed, and blessing idea that's outlined there. But in verse 3, it says, not only will the descendants of Abraham be blessed, but also All the families of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham, and through your seed. And as we come to the New Testament, as we look at Galatians 3, verses 8 and 16, Paul says that the promised seed of Abraham was talking about Jesus, the one through whom all the earth would be blessed with salvation. I would encourage you to write it down and look it up later where it says it quotes the in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and says that that God preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand what was it the gospel when God said in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and then further down in verse 16 Paul says he didn't say seeds as referring to many but seed singular as referring to one namely Christ right and so the promise that the world would be blessed through The seed of Abraham is ultimately about the gospel. Joseph became a blessing to the world in two ways. First, he provided physical bread to all who came to him, thus preserving them through the famine. But secondly, and more significantly, Joseph preserved the promised seed of Abraham from going extinct in the famine when his fathers and brothers came to him for bread. That's fast forwarding to later in the story. People from everywhere have to go to Egypt to get food. And Israel would have starved if they remained in the promised land and didn't go to Egypt to get bread. And so Joseph's actions preserved the promised seed of Genesis 3.15, the serpent crusher, the Messiah. Because a remnant was preserved through the famine, the promised seed of Genesis 3.15 would one day appear bringing salvation to the world. All the nations were drawn to Joseph as the source of the bread of life. And in a far greater way, Jesus is the bread of life who gives salvation to the world. Sidney Gradenus says, Here God blesses the world with food through Joseph. In the fullness of time, God will bless the world by sending his son Jesus. Jesus proclaims, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, end quote. Or Ian Duguid, who says this, quote, Just as Joseph's exaltation was not only for himself, so too Jesus' exaltation leads to blessing for all the nations if they will come and bow the knee before him. He himself is the true bread of heaven, the one whose broken body is the source of all life, end quote. So Jesus is the one who draws all nations to himself and freely offers them the bread of life. As I said earlier in this sermon, when God calls us into a saving relationship with himself, he calls us into his service. And understand this, brother and sister, he calls all believers as ambassadors for the gospel. 
We are to tell the world where to find the bread of life. It has been said by many that we are nothing more than poor beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. That's a pretty good description of evangelism. We are poor beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. Jesus alone has the bread of life. He freely gives manna from heaven. He gives living water to all who are thirsty. And so we, the people of God, have drunk freely from this fountain of life. We have tasted of this goodness. And so how could we not then point people where to find bread, right? We have tasted, we have seen, we have drunk freely. It's Jesus. And we point the way to Jesus. And so may we be faithful to point the way to Jesus so the nations can draw near to Jesus and in him receive the bread of life. You see, Jesus is the source of that bread. But there is a sense in which the nations come to us, or better, we go to them like the nations came to Joseph. See, we know where to find bread. We have the bread of life to give to a starving and dying world. And so we must answer our call right here, right now, in this place where God has put us in this season of life to be messengers who point people to the bread of life. See, the way that Jesus gives the bread of life to the world is through his death on a cross. He gives us life through death. The God showed his steadfast love for his people by sending his son to be our savior. Jesus left the palace in order to seek and save the lost. He was betrayed and sold by his brothers. He was stripped of his robe. He was, in a sense, forgotten and forsaken as the Father turned his face away from him so that we might never be forsaken. He was hanged on a tree like the chief baker, dying an accursed death for our sins. He remained in the pit for three days, but on the third day, he arose. He was restored. He was vindicated. He was clothed with honor. He now stands at the right hand of the king, and he uses his position to forgive those who betroll, betrayed and sold him. And for all who will come to King Jesus, bowing the knee humbly before him, he clothes us with royal robes. He clothes us in fine linen. He clothes us with the robes of his righteousness. And not only that, he promises to restore us, just as Pharaoh lifted up the head of the cupbearer and restored him. Jesus promises to raise us up with him when he comes in his kingdom. Jesus has been given the name above every name. And so we must live in such a way that we make Christ our boast, that we say Jesus is great, Jesus is glorious, go to him. We must do homage to the Son as we conduct our daily lives. And coming back around to where we began last time with the theme of waiting, as we think about these glorious future realities, our experience is at present that we still find ourselves waiting. We are in the already not yet. It's called inaugurated eschatology. We live in the already not yet, and we so often feel the not yet. We feel the how long, O oh Lord. But never forget in your waiting that the great refiner uses our waiting to forge us into a sharp, useful instrument that can be wielded by his hands. So while we are waiting, may we be faithful to answer the Lord wherever he calls us to go. And may we be big godders. May we put our confidence in a big and great and sovereign God, knowing that just as he has promised, in due time, he will exalt his servants. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the richness of your word to us.
We thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness to us, which is shown most supremely in the sending of your Son to be our Savior. Lord, when we are tempted to believe that you have forgotten us or don't care about us, we need only to look to the cross to be reminded of your great love. Father, we thank you that you gave up your own son. Jesus, you laid down your own life. Holy Spirit, you have poured the love of God within our hearts so that we might find rescue and redemption and forgiveness. God, we thank you for calling us into fellowship with yourself. And we are honored that you would call us into your service, that you would use worthless rebels and transform us not only into sons, but into ambassadors for your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would help us to remain faithful while we live in the already not yet. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.